Um, so briefly, I'm just going to mention who our speakers are today, and then I'm going to let them talk more about their centers. Um, first up, we're going to have Dr. Sarah Basmer, who's the director of The Connector at the University of Missouri and is also director of operations for ARIS. Um, after her, we'll hear from Jane Horowitz, who is the director of the Science Outreach Initiative at the University of Pennsylvania. Then we'll stay within the state of Pennsylvania, the Keystone State, and hear from Dr. Matt Johnson, who's a research associate with Penn State's Center for Science in the Schools and an assistant professor of science education at Penn State. Um, finally, we'll hear from Megan Heitman, who's a member of the ARIS leadership team and training team and um, worked with the SP at ISU project, which you'll hear more about, which supported broader impacts at Iowa State University. Um, and so those will be our speakers. And with that, I'm going to get off the stage and hand it over to Sarah Vasmer, who's going to talk about the work they're doing with the connector at Mizzou. First of all, I'm going to answer a question I got on chats. Can everybody hear us and have a, or, okay. Okay, so make sure that if you can't hear, just send an, send me a message in chat. I know there are a few people who had some issues. It might be a connection issue for that person. So hopefully, hopefully we're okay. Okay, I'm gonna share my screen, so bear with me. It worked before, it could, it could just blow up at any time. Um, oh, of course it blows up now. All right. All right, so as Jory said, my name is Sarah Basmer. I'm the director of the connector here at the University of Missouri. And I'm also um, director of operations for ARIS and I also was um, the program coordinator for NABI, so I've been around for quite a while. Um, the connector actually started in 2012, and I, my fearless leader, Susan Rito, she's on this call somewhere, she was a one-person shop starting in 2012. Um, and really what it was, was a place for researchers to find faculty support for broader impacts. Um, doing research consultations, and in those first years, it was assessing the landscape and a need assessment for the University of Missouri. As we moved along, I mean, as you can see through the timeline, there's some, some bigger that are tangentially related to the connector. In 2014, NABI was created, but in 2015, our office expanded. Uh, I came on board, so we became a two FTE shop, and uh, we also expanded our services campuses at the University of Missouri. So we have campuses in Kansas City, St. Louis, and Rolla, as well as Columbia, so we're surfing and doing for those sessions, for those institutions. Um, as we technical difficulties. Okay, sorry, I had to mute somebody. I've got the power here, so I can do that. <laughs> so in um, 2018, uh, Susan Reno, who was the former director of the Broader Impacts Network, um, she became the Assistant Vice Chancellor for Research, Extension, and Engagement, and so I took on the role as the director of the Connector. When we became the Connector, it was because we, we morphed from being an office that was sitting in the Office of Research and Economic Development to being co-funded by the Office of Research as well as um, the Office of Extension and Engagement here at the university. So we are funded in multiple areas on campus and that split mission has actually served us quite well. So that's where we are today. Uh, as you can see, this is a bit of a timeline and just sort of where our model is. We started out primarily working with researchers and now we are really trying to bring researchers to extension and extension to researchers, researchers to fulfill this overall culture of engagement mission at the University of Missouri. So, what we do really primarily works with um, identifying collaborators, creating networking opportunities, collaborations between our on-campus and off-campus units, as well as our communities surrounding the state of Missouri, around the state of Missouri. Uh, but we also do a bit of um, research development and professional development for faculty as well as extension staff. Um, so, I mean, we have a very wide mission now. So we started out really focused on NSF and broader impacts, and that's expanded to look beyond just NSF and think about engagement as a whole for our institution. 
So who we are, we have four FTE and a graduate student. Susan um, is the assistant vice chancellor, so she really it has a more visionary role at this point. I am doing kind of the day-to-day -day work with the connector as the director. We have an engagement programs manager, Rachel Bauer, who is in charge of our programming. Olivia Gill, who um, works with, she's a program coordinator and she really does just about everything you know, <laughs> needs to be done. She serves as fiscal responsibility as well as helping with coordinating our events and our professional development. And then Sarah Poole, our graduate assistant, who is assisting with some of the programming as well as she finishes up her master. Um, so what we do, as I mentioned, uh, our bread and butter is research development. We provide research development workshops and training opportunities, BI 101 and so on for faculty, and we're working on expanding those offerings. Um, but we also do one-on-one -on -one consultations for NSF grants, but also USDA, NIFA, um, just about any other type of engagement related um, uh, proposal we are happy to help with and we, we really try to help with. And then we also are starting to dabble into engagement programming and really what we're trying to do is create opportunities for faculty to be able to test their skills in engagement with some really no pressure opportunities. Uh, we have a film series called Extra Credit, which is a collaboration with a local um, art house movie uh, theater that we do a movie and then a faculty panel. Uh, we have Ignites, which is a STEAM camp that we offer each summer, and Columbia Young Scientists Expo and Fair. So most of our, our programming really serves communities that aren't necessarily addressed by other engagement programs on the campus. So for instance, Columbia Young, Young Scientists Fair is focused on homeschool children, and so we help support their science fair, but then we open Science Expo and have um, plenty of booths and some interactive exhibits for members of the the wider community as well. So really that's in a nutshell what we do, but as you all know, this is our core mission, but we are pulled in so many directions and we're happy to help as much as we can. So the bottom line, I think, um, I did. I was gonna start with this, but I thought that really would make sense. Um, we, because we had campus champions who saw the value of our work through uh, multiple vice chancellors of research, through the provost, um, through a National Science Board member, Doug Randall, who's now on the ARIS Council of Experts. They all saw the value of what Susan was doing and put money toward it. Um, in addition, we, we really hustle and we try to diversify our funding. Uh, started out with being funded by those, those startup funds, now we're being funded by foundations as well as, foundational support as well as extension and the Office of Research. And I, I should note that although we are the home of ARIS and formerly of NABI, we really don't receive any boost from that funding. It only paid a very small portion of the nice salary. So we really had to create avenues for funding for the connector outside of our national work. And then finally, just um, show your worth. We really had to try hard to justify our existence on our campus through collecting reviews from proposals that we worked on that showed a really positive, broader impact review, even if they weren't funded, through um, looking at how many proposals that we worked on that were funded. I know that it gets a little bit iffy when you're talking about research development because we can't control all the factors. And then also placing ourselves in a uh, position to show that what we do really makes a difference, not just through research and through NSF, but through all aspects of what's going on on campus, through extension, through engagement missions, through just working through each college as much as we can. So um, that's the connector. So I will turn it over to Jane, or is it Matt? Yeah, so Jane will be up next. Um, qu a couple quick reminders before we move on to Jane. Um, if you are on this call and you are not muted, please mute yourself so until you, you're asking a question so that everyone can hear. Uh, we will be, we are recording this webinar and it will be available through Eris's uh, YouTube site. Um, we're gonna have a brief survey at the very end of the webinar and I'll put up a link on the screen and ask you all if you're willing to take a few minutes to give us some feedback on this webinar. And finally, um, you don't need to wait until the official Q&A part of 
this webinar to ask your questions. You're welcome to type questions into um, the chat room now and, and several of us from Eris will do our best to respond as they come into the chat room. And yes, Susan um, Rowe, we will provide, well, I can only speak for myself. I'm happy to provide my slides. I'm assuming the other speakers will be willing to share theirs as well. That will be up to them. But um, those were the quick announcements. With that, I'd like to hand it over to Jane Horowitz from University of Pennsylvania. Jane, take it away. Okay, so I'm gonna share my screen here too. And are you seeing the whole screen or just the slideshow? You we are anything? seeing your slideshow. Okay, great. So I'm set to go. Hi, everybody. It's very exciting to see that there are 80 participants on this webinar. Um, thank you all for joining us today. So I want to take you through a brief chronology of how our office got started with an initial apology to Kristen, the assistant director. I realized when I just was staring at my uh, slide presentation that I didn't update her name which is now Kristen Coakley a share, and actually Kristen is going out on family leave next week with a baby due next month. So um, the office is myself, Kristen, and a part-time evaluator and a graduate student. So let me uh, advance my slides and give you a brief chronology. Um, I also thought it was interesting that Jory introduced us um, as the two universities from the Keystone State. I do want to make clear to folks that University of Pennsylvania is a private university. Penn State is public and sometimes we get confused, but that is actually an important part of my story. So I want to make sure to put that out. Our office grew out of several consecutive NSF grants. And I guess what I want to say is that I am now entering my 26th year here at the University of Pennsylvania, and most of that work has been funded by the National Science Foundation. So I came back to the university in 94, having worked primarily in informal science education, and joined our Graduate School of Education to run the Penmer Collaborative for Science Education, um, which was a professional development program for elementary school teachers that morphed into a similar program for middle school teachers in 2000. And then in 2005, I moved over to the, to the School of Arts and Sciences within the university to co-direct the Penn Science Teacher Institute, which consisted of two master's degree programs one for uh, in-service high school chemistry teachers, the other for in-service middle school teachers with very little science or math background. And when we got to about the midpoint of that program, my then co-director and I, both nervous for what was gonna be next in terms of our careers here at Penn, looked at what was happening at NSF in terms of uh, the increasing em emphasis on broader impacts and said, you know, it would be really silly to, to kick the two of us to the curb with all the knowledge and relationships that we had built up. Couldn't we continue to exist as an office that was in place to service our faculty researchers in terms of their broader impacts on National Science Foundation proposals? So Connie Blasey and I wrote a business plan, which we presented to uh, the powers that be in the School of Arts and Sciences. And again, I want to distinguish that we are at the school level, not the university level. I'll talk about that a little bit more in a few minutes. But in 2012, we were able to launch the Science Outreach Initiative Office within the School of Arts and Sciences. We've had a few different locations, but we're currently located within the building that houses the physics and astronomy department, as well as the Department of Mathematics. So we are unusual, I think, in that our office was originally established and still is in existence to support researchers with their NSF broader impacts. And I won't say that, that it's exclusively that, because just as we've heard before, our mission has has crept a bit in, in positive ways, but what we, are, uh, what we are here to do is not to write proposals, but rather to enhance the relationships that researchers can have 
with the community to identify needs that the community has that match up with what research want, researchers want to do. And our area of expertise is really public outreach. I do want to say that we serve as a conduit to other offices and programs within our university that do other types of broader impacts. So in other words, we have a relationship with our innovation center. If somebody wants to put together something that might end up being a product, um, we work with our office of uh, government and community affairs. If somebody is interested in policy and so on and so on and so on. And, um, but our work is, is very comprehensive. And we also, um, as Sarah said, have done a lot of work in looking at the impact of our work by requiring that anybody we work with within the university um, gives us feedback on their proposals when they get it. So we often say that our unofficial mission is making sure that no proposal comes back from the NSF unfunded for bad, broader impacts. Um, I do want to mention that we are, within Penn, not the only game in town. And that's been both an asset and a challenge to our work in that what we do really does overlap with other programs, centers, and offices. But what we did to kind of not get around that, that problem, but to enhance relationships is we formed a Penn STEM Alliance. So we have a group of individuals from mostly staff people, but some faculty, some graduate students who represent these other uh, centers that deal with public outreach. And together, we've really been able to do a better job of coordinating the activities that we have going on, both on and outside our campus. So I want to uh, just end that. And I have a couple of points that I've written down, which I'm gonna go through quickly which will give you some ideas on what was going through my head when we set up this office. First is to build on prior experiences and relationships. I mean, that seems obvious, but the folks that you've been working with over a long period of time can really come forward to help you um, to, to say how much you're, something like what you want to do is, is actually needed. And another, a second point I'd like to make is when we set up our office, um, it was kind of before all this networking was possible, and I spoke to a number of colleagues who were thinking along similar lines to gather information about how to do this, but when it came time to actually make a proposal to the powers that be, I made a point of comparing Penn to our peer institutions. I think that you know, there's a little bit of a competitive edge you can make if you say, um, and I'm going to use an, an example, well, Princeton University is doing this, or Yale University is doing this, and that was something that, uh, that was helpful in convincing uh, administrators that we needed to set up this office. Maybe the most important point I can make to all of you is to put your ideas in writing. We wrote a business plan, and in that business plan, we laid out what external factors might influence, why we needed to do this, and internally what was going on within the university. Mm -hmm. We also, in that business plan, put forth three different financial models in which, the, in which way the office could be set up, some of which required us raising our own money through grants, but ultimately what won out is we put forth the notion that we should be a one-year startup and that the administration should fund us for a year to see if we could prove our value. And that's exactly what happened. A fourth point, I think uh, maybe fifth point, is it's important to be housed within a STEM department. Initially, they put us in a business office and we found that faculty was very reluctant to come to us for help because they thought we were number crunchers. And when we moved into the Department of Physics and Astronomy, we found it a lot easier to develop lasting relationships. Um, I want to say, as Sarah did, we need to be clear on and constantly reassess how our office adds value to others that are already in existence. This notion of cultivating colleagues within your university. And finally, and again, I'm being redundant, but I will say, make yourselves indispensable. 
you have to be out there looking for work, um, talking to people and seeing what their needs are. It's all about relationships. I really think that's what's enabled us to keep on our, on our mission, to expand our operations and to be at the point where now that I'm out of business cards, they've actually agreed that they'll call us the Science Outreach Office instead of the Science Outreach Initiative. So I'll end there. Thanks very much, Jane. Um, and I know it's hard to speak and monitor comments at the same time, but you did get a couple comments while you were speaking from people who would be interested in seeing the business plan, if you would be willing to share that. So that's something that's all captured in the chat room and we, and we can right. revisit that later. Yeah, and I would be happy to share it. I will say that we are in the process of making a new one. Uh, it's a little bit dated. It, it has a lot of uh, a lot of text about the Obama administration. So just take that as you will. <laughs> um, great, thank you very much. Next up, we have Matt Johnson, uh, who's gonna be speaking about the Center for Science in the Schools at Penn State University. You are still muted, Matt. Um, how about now? Yep, we can hear you now. Great. Um, I just need Jane to unshare so that I can share my screen. Great. All right, so um, I'm at the Center for Science in the Schools, which was formed in the early 2000s, about 2004, when um, some of the administration at Penn State decided that um, in order to be more competitive for NSF um, awards like the Math Science Partnership, that um, we needed to have a, an initiative in place, particularly one that, that kind of formed a bridge between um, Penn State and the school districts in, in Pennsylvania. For those of you who have ever been to Penn State, it's pretty rural. Um, all the people in, in Pennsylvania live in Pittsburgh and Philadelphia for the most part, and um, Penn State's kind of right in rural central Pennsylvania. So it was formed that way, and originally it was um, a full-time tenure track um, science ed faculty and, a, and one administrative assistant, and then it was run with grad students. Over the years, as broader impacts kind of became higher stakes, um, the, it changed a bit. And so now we are um, seven people in our office, one administrative assistant, which should soon become two. Um, and we are housed in the College of Education. And so our primary focus is on teacher professional development for K-12 teachers. And um, this kind of goes along, if you read the um, the kind of overall broader impacts goals that, that NABI has in their guiding principles document. Um, two of the goals are to broaden participation and um, to improve STEM and STEM education at all levels. And so we work with teachers, primarily teachers that work in um, school districts that are kind of serve under underserved um, students, either first generation college, low income, um, we do work in the city sometimes with um, some racial diversity, but obviously in rural Pennsylvania, there's not very much of that. So we are um, partially funded by the by the university, by the college from a few different sources, about 60%. And what that really allows us to do is to work with researchers from all of the STEM colleges on their proposals, and we don't have to charge them for our services. Obviously, any of you that write proposals know that it takes a tremendous amount of time. So we help them write everything from um, career grants up to engineering research centers. We're on um, several different kinds of size grants. And um, one of the differences compared to a lot of the other broader impact centers that I've seen is that when we help them get the grant, then we actually do the, the teacher professional development programs. Um, so we implement. So for that reason, we have to be written in um, salary-wise and materials and things into the grant. So that's where the other 40% come from. Um, we found early on that this connection with the school districts and the intermediate units and the Commonwealth campuses and all the other education entities within Pennsylvania was really important. So we've actually kind of 
structured our center into a way that we have kind of like programming, people that specialize in programming and then people that specialize in outreach. Um, and when we say outreach liaison, we, we actually talk about someone that, that interacts pretty regularly with school district um, principals and superintendents, also with the Pennsylvania Department of Education um, and uh, intermediate units, which are uh, kind of a Pennsylvania specific thing, but they're kind of geographically um, centered groups of school districts. So we work with all of them so that they know that we exist so that we can be on the same page as, as the districts are with what they want for their teachers in terms of professional development. And so we can um, reach out and get support letters from them when we're going to submit a grant. Um, the workshops that we do range from one day workshops, which we call iSteam. Those are done during the academic year. Um, we do week long summer workshops that are usually based around a kind of a larger um, research project. And then we also do RETs, which are um, six week research immersion experiences for teachers um, where they are four days a week um, in the summer doing research in a lab and then one day a week with us trying to figure out how to translate the work that they do in the lab into something that is relevant and, and accessible for their students. We also do some programs with, with students, but it's usually through their teachers. So um, we have engineering challenges like Pennsylvania Kid Win Challenge, and then there's another one through an engineering research center that we work on called the Wearable Device Challenge, where students design wearable devices um, using portable electronics, wearable electronics to um, solve a problem for humans or animals. Um, and then most recently, we've um, our outreach liaison has also um, helped initiate a STEM ecosystem. And for those of you that aren't familiar with those, a STEM ecosystem is kind of a collection of not only education entities, but industries and nonprofits and foundations that are all in a geographic area to get everybody on the same page and, and network together so that they can work together towards improving um, you know, workforce development, economic growth, education, things like that. And so we've recently started um, a, an ecosystem. We're involved in the starting of an ecosystem called Engine, which covers um, 63 school districts within rural Pennsylvania. And so that's actually another really nice tie with, um, with the schools in terms of our broader impacts programs. Um, yeah, I think that's all I'll say right now. I'd be happy to take any questions when it's time. Great. Thanks very much, Matt. Um, just a couple of quick reminders. If you uh, haven't already done so, it'd be great if you could just type your name and your institution in the chat box so that we have a record of who's, who's here and who's listening. Um, and uh, there will be a brief survey at the end. So if you're willing to stick around, it would be helpful to ask if you'd fill that out. Um, finally, we're going to hear from Megan Heitman, who is part of the ARIS leadership team and the training team and also um, was an instrumental part of the SP at ISU, which is a lot of letters that she's going to tell us all about right now. Take it away, please, Megan. Okay, I think I'm sharing now. Is that correct? Yeah, you're good. All right. Um, I just wanted to start out by wishing everyone a happy Research Administrators Day. If you were not aware of that yet, um, it's actually an official like national celebration day. So happy Research Administrators Day for all of us who work in, in research and support research on our campuses. Um, I don't have a PowerPoint presentation. I just thought I would go through a couple things on the web. Um, you can see our website up here. This is not, it, it's kind of a dormant website now, but if you type in the URL, you will get us at spisu.isa.edu. Um, so our office was originally funded from a five-year NSF I-Cubed grant, which was Innovation Through Institutional Integration Program. Um, and it, we were funded in 2010. So we started our office specifically for a centralized BI support office in 2010, um, which I think is one of, one of the first recognized that that's all we did. Um, so a lot like the connector, 
we really only supported faculty. We didn't do the outreach and the activities like Matt's office did. Um, but we had some forward thinking people and we got NSF funding and those were support faculty in their, in their outreach and research impacts efforts on campus. And with that in mind, we called our office instead of a BI office, we called it the Strengthening the Professoriate at Iowa State um, because they really wanted to support faculty in this area of their, of their faculty life, of their professional life. Um, I will say that the having the NSF funding was great to get us off the ground. However, it, it is kind of a blessing and a curse because as we all know, soft funding ends and then there becomes a lot of issues on what to do from there. Um, so what Iowa State has done is we developed an office. I want to say this was in about 2014. So our grant was not over yet um, officially. But the uh, Vice President for Research Office created the Grants Hub, which is a centralized, basically, research development office. Um, we help with all areas of research development, from finding funding to helping write proposals, editing proposals, um, doing the, the BI support, and then also post-award management. They also do, we have a few members on the staff who um, who help create teams to go after larger interdisciplinary uh, research proposals. So SP at ISU kind of became enveloped in this larger grants, grant, what we call the Grants Hub office, um, which was kind of the Grants Hub concept was developed out of SP at ISU. So they, when they developed the Grants Hub, they wanted to do a lot of the same things we were doing around faculty research life, but make it broader and go around the entire proposal process and research process. Um, so all of the things that were on the SP at ISU website are now on the Grants Hub website under their broader impacts. Um, that's not greatly integrated yet. We, we just haven't had a whole lot of time to make it run smoothly. But I would say a couple things that really helped in that kind of transformed and helped SP at I, SU stay around um, is that we really gathered, and I'm going to go back to this other screen here real quick. We were really able to gather a lot of the programs on campus and really do kind of a campus climate of what, who on campus was helping faculty or who was doing these outreach things that faculty could partner with. Um, and so we created this database that has all of, well, not all of the programs on campus, but as many as we could find and was open to anyone um, who was willing to, to put their program up here that's something that faculty could partner with. Um, this has kind of proven invaluable when we did consultations with faculty members because they weren't aware of a lot of the things that were going on on our own campus that they could tap into. Um, and just like the other offices, we did a lot of trainings, we do a lot of consultations on proposals. Um, right now, our, we're kind of in a transition throughout all of campus. And here's kind of my pitch on having campus uh, champions, as Sarah said. We went through transition in our administration towards the end of our grant that our, our VPR changed over and a lot of the uh, associate VPRs in the office also changed over. And so we had to scramble towards the end of our funding to kind of make our case again, right? To, to prove our worth as everyone else has said. And so we kind of had to refine our champions. And in that process, we have definitely found some champions. We've also redone a lot of the support, um, grant support within the colleges at our university. And so it's more streamlined under each college rather than all the departments. And so what our VPR's office is now committed to doing is having broader impacts training for those people at each of the college level, or at least identify one of those support people who will have knowledge and that I can help with training um, at the college level who work with faculty on their research proposals. Um, so at Iowa State, we are now, the SP at ISU program has gone into the Grants Hub um, we still do broader impacts consultations. We still do a lot of training um, and we still disperse as many of the ARIS and, and NABI um, 
resources as we can. And it's very helpful that I've kind of been on both. So I think that's really all I have. It's not a whole lot different than what the connector has on their campus. Um, so we can bring it back to the Q&A part. Great, thank you to all of our panelists for sharing what they're doing at their institutions. And now I guess let's just open it up to Q&A. We've been getting a lot of great questions um, via the chat room and we've been trying to um, respond to a lot of those. I believe when we make the video of this webinar available, we can also make the transcript of the chat available. I hope I'm not misspeaking when I say that. Um, but in the meantime, let's open it up to questions for our panelists. Jory, I saw one in there real quick that um, asked about the fields of the database. So I'm just going to share this real quick one more time because I didn't actually click on anything. Um, so if you view our programs that we have listed, these are what's listed. Um, and if I click on one, then it kind of has the program offerings, advice for partnering with them. It's more toward geared towards faculty members themselves and not the program audience that they serve. Um, let me see if I can find another good one. It has a lot of information. No, oh, that one wasn't it. But if you if you get on here, you can look at it and um, see what kind of information that we have on there and there's and some of them also has not only advice for partnering with that particular program but opportunities that that program would like to see that they're lacking in that faculty could help them fulfill great okay we we have a question from i hope i'm pronouncing right kanya um for all the panelists would you all recommend being school or college level or university level um sort of in terms of your funding i guess and who you serve um, she says we have been both and still struggle to get a firm on foot, uh, get a firm footing. So um, I know your various um, of the panelists are are located in various different levels of their institutions. So could you address that question about sort of where you are, where you are based within your institution and how that works for you? I'll go first. Um, the connector is centralized, so we. Um, Research. And uh, I'm going to mute somebody. Um, <laughs> so we really um, work with any department or college on campus. And now that we're working with Extension, we work as much as we can with um, all the Extension faculty and field faculty. So that could encompass up to 114 counties. And I really think it gives us a good perspective in terms of finding collaborators, but also having a um, overall view of engagement on our campus. Um, but as a result, our funding is coming from geo dollars. So, I mean, if any grant gets FNA, obviously it's going to go to the Office of Research and it's dispersed to our office in some capacity. We're not, we're not specifically written into grants, nor would I love to be in that position, to be honest. Okay, I'll take it. Uh, as I mentioned in my presentation, we are at the school level. And I'll be honest and say that when we set up the office, my dream was that we would move to the provost level and have uh, influence across the university. But that proved to be more than we were able to do. However, because we've been successful within the School of Arts and Sciences, we're now also doing this work for the School of Engineering. And I think that the answer to the question is, it depends. Um, but what's important is that wherever you're situated, that you're doing really high quality work and people will notice and that will perhaps ensure your future. Um, I can speak real quick. We were at the university level. Um, Having said that, we have five different colleges within the university. We really only worked with three, maybe four of them. Um, we didn't do hardly anything with our College of Business uh, because it just, they don't apply to NSF and it didn't make any sense. We did the majority of our work with um, the College of Engineering and the College of Engineering actually hired me for a short time to be kind of the BI expert in their centralized support office. 
Um, so that's another thing that's happened on our campus is that each of our colleges, at least the ones that do a lot of research dollars, um, the College of Engineering, our Liberal Arts and Sciences College, and our College of Ag and Life Sciences, um, all have their own smaller support departments for research in each of the, at each of the college levels. Um, and so now what we're, what I'm going to go around and do is train one of the people in each of those offices at the college level um, so that they can support faculty in their college uh, in various areas of, of BI support. And then we also have the grants hub at the university level who can also do that across campus wide. So I, I kind of like that hub and spokes kind of model, but that's just kind of what's been working at Iowa State. So we, we've gotten a, oh, Matt, did you have anything to add? Or? Well, I was just gonna say that we were originally, um, it was intentionally that we were university wide so that we could work with any of the STEM colleges. There are five STEM colleges at Penn State and um, we just uh, recently changed to being um, a college of education um, center. Those were decisions kind of um, above my pay grade, so I don't really know what the reasons were. I'm sure they're political in some way, but it hasn't affected the work that we've done or how we've done them. Um, we just kind of work for any of the STEM colleges that, or any of the faculty that come to us from the STEM colleges that want to write broader impacts. Great. Um, we've received a number of questions on the topic of evaluation and for those of you who've ever been to an Abbey Summit which I'm assuming is many of you or most of you you know this is a perennial topic of conversation and discussion um, really briefly um, would any of you care to comment on sort of how your office handles evaluation of BI programs and activities we do not provide evaluation um, we we uh, help researchers find collaborators, experts who can do that for them. Um, or sometimes if the budget isn't going to allow paying for a consultant, um, we suggest that they look at, you know, sometimes when you're creating a BI plan, you throw them into some sort of existing programming to build upon that programming. And so usually those existing programs have evaluation built into what they're doing, hopefully. And so we, we ask them to work with those partners um, or otherwise we, we point them to resources where they can um, try to identify ways that they can learn how to evaluate their own project. I'll go. We do, we have a part-time evaluator on our staff. And uh, you know, the, the bind we find ourselves in is that we're quite capable of putting forth a pretty thorough plan for evaluation, but nobody has room in the NSF proposals to do it. So we've sort of prepared some stock text that, that people can put into the proposal that says we have the capacity to do that in-house. However, I mean, when called upon, we create logic models for people. We work with them quite intensely, but because the scope of what they generally are proposing to do, at least in terms of outreach, is pretty limited. We do what Sarah has, has alluded to, which is try to plug people into existing programming that has aggregated evaluation. Um, but we do, the one thing we always joke about is like, we're not the evaluation police. We can't really go back after somebody's gotten a grant and force them to do something, but I can assure you that when they have a, an annual report due, that that's something they do come to our office for. Anyone else? Um, we do some of our own evaluation when the grants are smaller, um, but sometimes the, the grant calls for an external evaluator, so we help the researchers find someone else in that capacity. Like, like Jane said, sometimes there's just not a lot of room to go out and hire somebody, so um, several of us in the office have experience with evaluation um, and education research, so we, we do help in some cases, but we really don't ever try to focus on that because, I mean, that can be a, a whole separate job in, it, in and of itself. It's a time consuming and, you know, costly. Yeah, yeah. I can, I can tell you um, that my office here at Duke is an office of one and, and that's me and this is it. It's this office. And um, <laughs> so I don't have the capacity to help people with evaluation, but I'm, we're fortunate here at Duke that we have a social sciences research institute and they have a lot of experts in program evaluation 
and are happy to take on sort of subcontracting gigs. And so usually my first step when I'm meeting with Duke faculty is to direct them towards the SSRI uh, here at Duke, and that usually works pretty well for them. Um, Jerry, we are, can I just add one more thing? Yes, please. Um, we also have a similar office at Iowa State that's in our School of Education that does a lot of research and education studies um, and does a lot of evaluation for broader impacts areas of our proposals on campus. And one advantage to having an office that kind of does that is once we started using them a lot or referring faculty to them and had um, our VPR's office become aware of the quality of the stuff that they do, we were able to consolidate some of our evaluation from smaller projects into one. Um, so we had a lot of, they basically came up with one REU survey instrument that all of the REUs could use as a standard and then add a few of their own questions. But then we had kind of a base work of, of what REU support looks like on our campus as a whole, not just from each of the smaller individual projects. Great, thank you. Um, so we're, we're starting to, I'm trying to be conscious of time and I know that people probably need to move on at one. So um, I would like to um, address something that's come up in a few questions and is also something that I was hoping to share with the group. So let me share my desktop one more time. Um, and this is a program that, let's see, I can get this. Oh, someone else is sharing, I think. Someone needs, if anyone's sharing, please unshare. Okay, are you seeing my desktop now? No. No. Okay. I'm not uh, sharing anymore. Okay, let me try this one more time. I'll see if I can share. There you go. Are you, what are you seeing now, Megan? The program to expand institutional capacity. Okay. Good, <laughs> thank you. So really briefly, because a, a number of questions have come up about this, and this is a program that we are in the process of rolling out at ARIS. We're really excited about it, and it's really in response to a lot of the requests that we've been getting over the years. Um, this, um, as you probably all know, um, ARIS has been, and, and prior to ARIS, NAVI has been doing individual visits to individual institutions to offer half-day, full-day, sometimes multi-day training workshops. Um, but this new program is an effort to um, help institutions through sort of a mentorship type of program build their own capacity so that rather than needing to bring ARIS folks to their campus to run workshops, which we're still happy to do, I should say, um, but rather than having to rely only on that, we want to help institutions build and expand their own capacity so that they can do um, feel more comfortable with the BI support they're offering on their campus and possibly even develop a BI office if they don't have one and that's a priority for them. So you can see some of the details here, as many as I could fit on a single slide. Um, it's gonna be a one, uh, one and a half year program. It'll be cohort based and we're gonna open it up to primarily academic institutions is who we expect to be the main participants in this, but also potentially open it if there's interest to research centers and institutes and professional societies who would like to do more to support um, expand their capacity to support BI within their institution or center or society. Um, some of the things that participating institutions will do and will receive, um, it will include um, training for the BI professional at that institution to be able to um, provide their own, run their own workshops and training on their campus. Um, it'll be a sort of intensive train the trainer program um, and at the end, the BI professionals at the participating institutions will be ARIS certified to be able to offer BI training. Um, there will be, um, of course, guidance and mentorship from the ARIS leadership and the ARIS training team to help you build this capacity and, and build this office on, at your institution. Um, institutions will come out of this program with a survey, a BI or broader impacts landscape survey. Uh, for their institution as well as a comprehensive database of potential partners within their institution and within their community um, that can help um, match faculty and people writing proposals with potential partners. Um, and it will be, um, there will be an emphasis on really building and strengthening ties between the people who are the boots on the ground, people doing BI support 
and the VPRs, the Vice Provost of Research and other people, sort of the upper levels of administration who are in the position to affect policy change. So that's an important component of it as well. Um, we are gonna initially, the first year, the first cohort will be a pilot study with a limited number of institutions. And then based on what we learned from that, we will hopefully expand it to include more institutions and in subsequent cohorts. Um, so be on the lookout for a request for applications coming soon. Um, and let me exit out of this now and go back to questions. Um, okay, so we can take questions. We have a few more minutes. Um, we could take questions on that or um, on anything else um, that people want to ask before I hand it off to Susan for a couple kind of a couple of closing comments. Okay. Um, one other thing that we did receive some questions on, um, and we'll have to go quickly here, but I know um, this is a, a big area of interest for people who are considering establishing offices. Um, for, the, for our panelists, how does your office assess its own success? What metrics do you use to demonstrate to administration that you're successful? And what are the things that the administration cares about primarily? One of the things that we report on every year is how many proposals we help submit. Obviously, the broader impact sections can be great. If the research isn't very good, it's not going to get funded or it's super competitive. It comes down to some a, a bit of luck. But I, I know that our dean likes to see that we are, are productive and we submit somewhere around 25 grants a year um, with researchers. Um, but we also do a lot of other things related to dissemination, which is important to them. Um, you know, we're involved in a number of things on campus service-wise. So I wouldn't say that we're, we're definitely not evaluated in the same way as tenure track, but they do like to see that we're um, contributing in a lot of ways. Other panelists? Um, we do the best we can to, to similarly tabulate the number of proposals we've worked on. Um, we can. We also have full access to our online proposal system for the university, so we can pull down information and see which proposals we didn't work on and tabulate that as well. And one thing I didn't mention is we do a lot of work now with graduate research fellowship proposals, and Kristen is really responsible for that. She does a fabulous job of collecting the metrics and sharing them. I have to confess it's something I wish we did better and I have a feeling as we move forward, we will be held more accountable, but up to this point, um, they've kind of let us slide. Great, Megan or Sarah? Uh, okay. I would say just real quickly, we did not do a great job, so that might be why our office uh, kind of went by the wayside when the funding ended for a little bit. Um, but I will say our Grants Hub does a very uh, good job of tracking all of the projects that we work on and then following up and seeing which ones are funded so that we can have that same um, metric that everybody else has, has talked about. Great. Um, we're almost out of time. I, we had a couple other questions that I can address quickly. One is um, someone had a question about when this webinar will be available, uh, a recording of it will be available to view online. I don't know the answer to that question. Sarah might have an answer or Olivia might have an answer, but I think just as quickly as they can get this uploaded to the YouTube site, we will send out an announcement to the NABI slash ARIS listserv to share that information. Sarah, do you have anything to add or? Uh, yeah, I think um, once we have it, I, I think we'll probably have to get rid of a few of the first minutes of us trying out our slides, but um, once we get it edited down, we can send it out and we'll let everybody know as well as include the chat, um, uh, the chat uh, text as well, so. Great, thank you. Um, I, you should see on your screen a link and a QR code if you're willing to fill out the survey um, on this webinar, that would be very helpful to us. Finally, I just want to hand it over to Susan, hopefully Susan Reno, you are still there, um, to just sort of wrap up and say a, a few words about um, everything that we care about. 
Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you to our panelists for doing such a great job and for our community for asking such wonderful questions. I'm really excited that there are so many organizations who joined us today. You know that this came out of a simple question that started on our listserv almost a year ago. Um, and we had almost 100 people who said we'd be, they'd be interested in this. And we had um, just short of that um, today. So thank you for doing this. I just want you to know that ARIS is committed to supporting this in any way we can. So um, let us know what resources you need, what will be most helpful. I heard today that people are interested in a mentoring program, um, which is actually something that we wrote into the original um, ARIS grant. Um, to be fair, we'd love to do that and we want to do more of that. So um, we're just getting things still up and running. But if that's something that really the community is interested in, we can definitely move that up a little bit higher on the list and you can help us with that. Um, help us also think about what kind of follow-up you'd like from this particular webinar. It's always awesome to be able to go back and watch the video, but you may think of questions that you, you know, tomorrow or tonight or in a couple of weeks. Um, so if there's anything else we can do to help follow up with this, let us know. Um, just a couple of things that I heard from the speakers that I want to just reiterate. Um, diversified funding streams really help to solidify your position so that you're not relying upon one particular funding stream. Um, early on in the life of the Broader Impacts Network, the office that I sat in, the entire office was let go in a cost-saving measure except for my position. And a lot of that had to do with the fact that I had a variety of funding models and um, it wasn't really cost saving for that office because I had money coming from different places. Um, so thinking about diversifying your funding, campus champions are key. It's really helpful to have administrators and faculty who are fighting for you and saying that this is really important. It also is um, really helpful for sustainability. I really think the comprehensive scope helped. One of the reasons why we switched from the broader impacts network to um, the connector was because people really thought we only worked on NSF grants, so we work on a lot more than that, so being comprehensive is helpful. Um, we talked about this a lot, showing the value added, what you bring to the campus, because here in the Office of Research, I sit around people who are really mandated, compliance, IRB, animal control, all those things are things that universities have to have. Nobody has to have a BI office. So how do we make yourselves indispensable so that they actually want to have that and see it as on that same level? And then um, I really liked what Jane said about comparing to your peer institutions. Um, I definitely use that to my advantage here. Um, just a quick anecdote, when we had the first Broader Impact Summit here, I had to compete for money. And I put up a really terrible slide that showed all these arrows coming to Columbia for this meeting. And then the next sign showed all the arrows flying over Missouri, flying to Stanford. And I was like, you know, if we don't do it, somebody else is going to. So we should get in this game. Um, Iowa State was definitely a model for us. So leveraging ARIS and the, and the ARIS community is really helpful. And then um, just again, that whole tension between whether you run programs or not. Um, the, the Broader Impacts Network was set up not to run programming, and Megan mentioned that before. And there are pluses and minuses to that. When you don't run programming, you are dependent upon any kind of funding, whether it's internal or grant funding. At least if you um, are running some programs, that might be a revenue stream, but then that opens up other things. So which one is best for you? And then the last thing is institutional versus being at the college department level. Um, one of the things you'll hear from us all the time is that there's not one answer. And that's one of the reasons why we had such a diversity of people on this panel is that you have to figure out what is the best fit for your institution. So, um, so you'll never hear us say there's just one way to do it. So thank you for being on the panel today. Thank you to, again to our panelists for being here, for you signing into the webinar. I hope it was helpful. And if there's anything else that we can do, um, let us know. Thanks to all our panelists. Thanks to all of you for tuning in and see you in Durham in April for the ERA Summit.